So what I want to tell you about today is a revolution in medicine that is play, taking place right now, and a lot of this is actually taking place right here in San Diego. And key to this revolution in medicine are stem cells, which I'm sure all of you have already heard about. And what I specifically want to tell you about today is how stem cells can move us from just treating diabetes to potentially curing this disease. So nowadays, life with diabetes means, as all of you know, 10 or more needle pricks every day to measure the blood sugar levels and then to dose the right amount of insulin according to the blood sugar measurements. And diabetic people even who are most vigilant and check their blood sugar levels every couple of hours, eat the right amount of food, never quite accomplish what the normal pancreas does is, which is to bring the blood sugar levels to normal. So with every blood sugar me measurement for a person with diabetes comes the worry of, is my blood sugar either going to be too high or too low? And people who have diabetes know that having high blood sugars puts them at risk to developing these long-term complications of diabetes, which includes stroke, heart disease, and eventually even kidney failure and blindness. And having low blood sugar attacks can be equally detrimental because what low blood sugar attacks do is they can actually make you pass out. And there are people who suffer from type 1 diabetes who are even unable to drive a car. So the hope for every person with diabetes is to wake up one morning and not having to worry about constant blood sugar checks, insulin injections, and to simply eat a normal day and spend one day not thinking about their diabetes. So how could we possibly accomplish every day to measure the blood sugar levels and then to dose the right amount of insulin according to the blood sugar measurements? And diabetic people even who are most vigilant and check their blood sugar levels every couple of hours, eat the right amount of food, never quite accomplish what the normal pancreas does is, which is to bring the blood sugar levels to normal. So with every blood sugar me measurement for a person with diabetes comes the worry of, is my blood sugar either going to be too high or too low? And people who have diabetes know that having high blood sugars puts them at risk to developing these long-term complications of diabetes, which includes stroke, heart disease, and eventually even kidney failure and blindness. And having low blood sugar attacks can be equally detrimental because what low blood sugar attacks do is they can actually make you pass out. And there are people who suffer from type 1 diabetes who are even unable to drive a car. So the hope for every person with diabetes is to wake up one morning and not having to worry about constant blood sugar checks, insulin injections, and to simply eat a normal day and spend one day not thinking about their diabetes. So how could we possibly accomplish this? Well, as you have heard throughout the course of this day already, is that the only way to accomplish this is to bring the cells back that are lost in diabetes. And you know that these cells are the pancreatic beta cells that secrete insulin and that reside in an organ in your abdominal cavity called the pancreas. So for a few very select people who suffer from this disease, such, sort of, such curative treatment for diabetes already exists through a procedure called islet cell transplantation, about which you will actually hear more throughout the course of this day. So what is done in islet cell transplantation is that we isolate the insulin cells from the pancreas of a recently deceased person, and these insulin cells are then infused into the liver of a diabetic patient and magically, these cells then home in the liver and begin producing insulin in the, in the uh, liver of this diabetic patient. So you may ask yourself now, why, why is it not that we're already treating all the people with diabetes with this islet transplant, transplantation? Well, there comes a huge price with islet transplantation, and it is that we actually need to give these patients heavy immune suppression. So why is it that the immune system needs to be suppressed after received an islet transplant? Well, as I've told you, these insulin cells are isolated from another person. So it is just like a foreign organ. So just like a person who received a liver transplant or a kidney transplant, the immune system will try to attack these islets that we transplanted and will try to eliminate these newly um, transplanted insulin cells from the liver of the diabetic patient. So people who have received these transplants 
need to receive lifelong immunosuppressive therapy, and these drugs have heavy side effects. Another um, limitation for a more widespread use of um, transplantation is that there are simply not enough organs from deceased people to meet the, many, the demands of the many people who suffer from type 1 diabetes. So researchers all over the world, and including my laboratory here at UC San Diego, have set out to find an alternative source for a replacement insulin cell. So researchers are trying many different strategies to potentially create an unlimited pool of these cells that we could transplant into people with diabetes. So one avenue that people are pursuing, and you will hear once again more about this later in the day um, in this, um, in the, um, from, from another speaker, is that we could potentially isolate islets and these insulin cells from pigs. And because we can breed a lot of pigs, we could then maybe um, cure diabetes by simply having this pool of islets from another animal. Another strategy that many researchers have tried is to take these um, islets isolated from humans and to expand these into the culture dish so that if we actually had a pancreas um, from a deceased person and we isolated the insulin cells, we could simply try to make more of them in the culture dish and then thereby meet the demands of more people who might want to receive an islet transplant. However, I can tell you that many, many people have tried to expand these cells in the dish, but that insulin cells don't like to replicate, as you have already heard from previous speakers. And so far, we really don't have a strategy to expand these cells in the culture dish. A really innovative idea that is tried by many um, labs throughout the world right now is to possibly coax other cells from other organs, such as the liver or the gallbladder, to begin to produce insulin. So the idea there is that you could liver, take liver cells or gallbladder cells, and all of you know that we don't really need the gallbladder because there's probably many of you in this room who don't even have a gallbladder anymore. And if we could now find factors that would change the gallbladder cells into cell, <coughs> cells that are more like the cells of the pancreas and coax these cells to begin making insulin, that's an idea that people are pursuing. And it is still early days, so I, it's really not clear yet whether this strategy is going to work, but I just want to let you know that researchers are actually exploring these ideas. An idea that is looking already very promising is the idea to derive new insulin cells from so-called pluripotent cells. And pluripotent cells are stem cells. And the nature of stem cells is that they have the capacity to give rise to any tissue in your body. So they're early cells that really haven't really made a decision as to what they want to be. So if appropriately instructed in the culture dish, we could possibly make all kinds of body cells from these um, stem cells in the culture dish so when you think about it, if we could now make heart muscle cells, then potentially these cells could help cure people with heart disease. If we could make neurons, we could possibly treat people with Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's and help them, help them alleviate their symptoms. And then most importantly, and probably of most interest to you here in the audience, we could possibly instruct these cells to become these insulin-producing beta cells for treatment of diabetes. So the most prominent stem cell that we know about is the embryonic stem cell. So what are embryonic stem cells? And all of you have read a lot about embryonic stem cells, heard about them, because there's a lot of discussion about the ethics of their use in the media. So I just want to tell you how embryonic stem cells um, are generated and where they actually come from. So in the 1970s of the last century, researchers learned how to actually um, make embryos in the culture dish. And a lot of couples now use this technology to have babies because uh, through in vitro fertilization. So what is done in in vitro fertilization clinics is that the eggs are taken and the sperm is taken in the culture dish, and then the sperm and the egg fuse, and they actually produce an early embryo. And the first couple of days of embryonic development that normally takes place in the body of a woman is now taking place in the culture dish. And what we can do is right before we would implant these embryos back into the womb of a woman to induce a pregnancy, we can isolate a few cells from this early embryo and put them in the culture dish. And these are embryonic stem cells. 
So researchers have worked with these embryonic, uh, the, with these in vitro fertilization clinics to obtain embryos um, that were produced and that are sitting in these freezers in the in vitro fertilization clinics and have derived cell lines that can now be perpetuated in the culture dish, as we know, for pretty much unlimited amounts of times. So because these cells come from the very, very early embryo from which the entire body of a human being will eventually form, they can give rise to any cell type in your body. So these cells have the potential to then also give rise to insulin-producing cells, and researchers are trying really hard how, um, to figure out how to instruct these cells to make beta cells in the culture dish. So I want to also give you a little bit of a perspective of how, how long have researchers already known about this? How did we figure this out? And just as a small perspective, we only learned a little bit more than 10 years ago how to isolate these cells from a human embryo and how to cultivate these cells in the culture dish. So this is a very young field. And a little bit more than five years ago, another major breakthrough that now really stands to revolutionize medicine was made in that we learned how to make cells that are just like embryonic stem cells from anyone's own skin. So I could now go and take a skin biopsy from any one of you here in the room, put that little piece of skin in the culture dish, expose that skin to some, culture, to some factors, and then these factors will turn your skin cells into cells that are just like embryonic stem cells. So the idea is then that we could potentially make stem cells from any person who suffers from a disease, and then if we then can instruct these stem cells in the culture dish to differentiate into either heart muscle cells or pancreatic beta cells, there would be sort of a supply of replacement cells that actually have the same identity genetically as um, the patient who will then receive this transplant. So the beauty about these so-called induced pluripotent cells, and these are the cells that are derived from the patient's own skin, are that they're genetically identical to the recipient who will later receive the transplant. So these um, patients then are transplanted with cells that were derived from your own skin will not need the immunosuppression that we actually need for other organ transplants. So this is a huge potential for medicine that is now being explored throughout the world by many researchers, and we will see that um, more and more we will see cells actually moving into clinical trials and see how these cells will be used to treat diseases. So how far have we gotten into instructing these cells in the culture dish to actually be a replacement insulin cell that we could transplant into humans? Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as depicted in this picture. And that it is not possible to simply take these cells, to put a bunch of growth factors into the culture dish, and then hope that these cells will, in one step, um, turn into insulin-producing cells that we could immediately transplant back into humans. So what we have learned is that what we have to do in the culture dish is to do what the human embryo does in the first place. So when you think about it, when you start out after egg and sperm fuse, and you just have this little clump of cells of maybe 60 cells that have not decided what to be, it's not that the first thing you will actually do during human embryonic development is to grow a pancreas. There's a lot of steps that actually precede the making of a pancreas, and that's exactly what we need to do in the culture dish, and that we need to walk these cells to all these individual steps to first make these cells known that they actually are pancreatic cells and then eventually turn these cells into insulin cells. So how far have we come in this process? The good news is that we have already come a very long way. And very instru instrumental to this progress has been um, a local biotech company actually here in San Diego, Viaside. And this company has devised a strategy that now allows us to generate pancreatic precursor cells from these pluripotent cells in the culture dish. What we currently still don't understand is how to turn these precursor cells into fully functional insulin-producing beta cells for transplantation. And my lab, um, as well as many other labs, and we do this also in collaboration here in San Diego with this company, Viaside, is working hard to try to lift this roadblock and figure out how we can also accomplish these last steps in the culture dish. 
So once we have made these cells, you have learned also throughout the course of this day that type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. So there will still be these immune cells in the body of the person we would transplant these cells to that will try to attack these new insulin cells. So how can we possibly protect these cells from being attacked by the immune system? And what is being devised by companies now is this idea that we simply put these cells into little mini bags. So by bagging them up, and these bags would have little pores that allow the insulin to go out, but the pores will not allow the bad immune cells to go in. So the idea then is to shield the cells from the immune attack and to maybe just transplant these mini bags underneath the skin. So if anything weird ever happened with the cells, we would have a really easy way to take these little bags out and then prevent um, possible danger to the patient. So now you, the quite big question that you will probably ask is, well, how long is it going to take until we can actually try the first cells in human clinical trials and until the first people with diabetes can now receive um, <clears throat> these transplants from the insulin cells? And what I have to tell you is that if anyone gave you an exact number, the person would be lying. Because the truth is that it wouldn't be science if we exactly knew how to do it. Because the scientist sort of phases something that I've depicted here in this maze, in that you know you can get to your goal, which for us is the cure for diabetes, but you don't quite know how to get there. So what you will do is you take an educated guess and you try, and along this road you will hit a roadblock. But from what you've tried, you will also have learned something. So with your next attempt, you will actually go a little further through this maze. And given the enormous um, progress that we have made in stem cell research in a span of only 10 years, it is only going to be a matter of time until we actually figure out these last steps and we're going to hit this home run and the first insulin cells will actually go into diabetic patients. And I just want to leave you because this is um, a venue here taking place in San Diego that a lot of this exciting research is taking place right here in San Diego. And all of you might have actually driven along Torrey Pines. And um, there's just a new building that was um, built right um, next to the Glider Park. And in this building is where all the stem cell scientists in San Diego are actually now moving together to use their collective knowledge to really figure out these cell therapies for many different diseases. And because on the Torrey Mesa we have so many superb research institutions and also a lot of companies that are trying to put these, um, to launch clinical trials, it is really this collective effort um, that will eventually get us to um, curing all these diseases um, that, the, that so many people are suffering from. And um, I'm going to close here <laughs> and just thank everyone. <laughs>